My name is Lisa Blair, and I'm a member of the Right Relations Resource Team and the Faith Formation and Outreach Minister at Trinity United Church in North Bay. I'm a Haudenosaunee woman living and working in North Bay, a city that is nestled between Lake Nipissing and Trout Lake, on lands and near waters that have sustained many Indigenous peoples from time immemorial to the present. Anishinaabe, Cree, Algonquin, Oji Cree, Métis, and in recent history, settler peoples from many different nations have all three areas in and around the Apology and home. As people of the Apology, we seek to live together in peace and friendship, honoring the treaties, seeking justice, and walking together in the spirit of reconciliation. I'm very grateful to Lisa for sharing that introduction with us. We'll hear more from her next week. We are people willing to walk a new way, and we thank all those folks right across Canada providing us with great leadership. I wanted to start my reflection today with a sort of sense, a little bit of what we see when we see these pictures here. You may be getting to recognize the person on the right there, Alberta Billy. You've heard her story a little bit in the last few weeks and her courage of standing up in 1981 to demand the church respond with an apology. Beside her in this picture is um, from Belcaris, Lorna Standing Ready. These are the names we need to know. When we are challenged, say their name. We want to be able to say the name of Alberta Billy and Laura Standing Ready, two strong leaders as we learn to walk this new path. Their pictures will come up, and maybe if you have a sense of a memory like a phone it'll come up at an odd time our phones do that you'll be turning your phone on in the morning and suddenly it'll tell you what you did three years ago or more and they'll say things like this will only be shared with others with your permission as if it was going to be something terribly naughty or a state secret from deep earth but those pictures are sometimes quite mundane i often take pictures of where i park my car I don't like to lose my car in a car park, so I park, take a picture of my car, and I don't always remember to delete those photos, so sometimes Google will say, do you remember this exciting event that took place? It's, you know, at some deep level of a car park in downtown. But sometimes um, there are other pictures that make you smile. The other day, for some reason, I got a grand, my grandson Nicholas's picture came when he was just in preschool, Nick's finished high school now, and it did make me smile to see that little face. And um, just, I uh, guess the day before yesterday, I got a reminder of something we used to have on Bowen Island at Snug Cove, our harbor. And if you've ever gone there by ferry, that's where you would have landed. We used to have something called steamship days, and we would all wear white. And on that day, we listened to Dal Richards Really, Dal Richards was there on Bowen playing with his big band. And that is also a moment that makes you smile to remember it. Not a mundane thing, a kind of a connection with a treasured memory, solid memory. And then a photo will come up. And it's as if your camera is saying to you, hey, do you remember when you saw the glaciers in Alaska three years ago? as if you could ever forget the blueness of that ice or the roar of the calving as it crashed into the water. Not just a great memory, not just a smile, but a heart treasure. Seeing the glaciers in Alaska is one of those heart treasures for me. You could call it, for me, an experience of wordless wonder where all you said at the time was, wow, did you see that? Wow, this huge wave comes as that mammoth piece of ice crashes into the water and it stops you in your tracks. And at that moment, you don't notice, well, well for me it was hundreds of people around me speaking different languages, all of them seeing an angle on the same thing I was seeing because I was lost in wonder, just like that old hymn says, lost in wonder, watching this happen. The color of that ice was so startling. 
I still can't find the right words. If you haven't seen it, I haven't done a very good job of explaining it. I know, because words can only kind of give you 5% of what it was like to see that, especially for the first time. Kind of a double wow. And all that time, all the times I've been up to Alaska and seen that, it hasn't lost its sense of sacred moment for me. I'm so keen to see those glaciers while they're still there. I despair the loss of them. And when I was there that first time and I realized I might have it again, I spent time at the, at the edge there scanning the ice, scanning to see if I would see a crack and hear that roar. And then one time, about five years ago, we were rewarded for being scanning which is three humpback whales came up in the water between our ship and the glaciers. And I kind of thought, it doesn't get much sweeter than this. I'm sure that you've had that moment when you've seen a ballerina do something, you think, wow. Like at one point you may be thinking, how did she do this? How many hours has she practiced? How can she stand on those little tiny shoes? And then you go to that next place that lost in wonder place, that depth of response. Right now we were watching the Tokyo Olympics and I'm sure you've seen that and seen some of those aquatic teams and acrobats and different people and you know there's hundreds of hours and there have been injuries and heartbreak and disappointments but you see them work through a routine flawlessly as it appears to you and you just say, wow. Those moments of being lost in wonder. And those wor wordless wonder moments can describe our relationship with our Holy Creator, the Holy One. So, of course, people call it the cloud of unknowing, that God is our cloud of unknowing, because we don't have words. We just end up fumbling around as I am this morning. It was Blaise Pascal 500 years ago who first came up with that phrase of God as the infinite abyss. The divine abyss is how Marcia McPhee talked about it when we saw her earlier introduction to this service. It's the place below words or deeper than feelings. And it can be caused by many things. There's no one thing. I'm sure other people on the boat seeing the glaciers we're going, oh, is that all? Maybe what time's the lunch? It happens, doesn't it? You're there lost in wonder and somebody else is thinking, I wonder what? It's just the way life is. We're all so unique. And we don't have it in common, but we do have something in common, which is we can't easily communicate exactly what it feels like to experience the divine in life. Hence the phrase, the abyss the unknowing. How do you explain the divine nature of things? Flowers, driftwood, candles. Sometimes God is such a mystery beyond our comprehension, beyond our articulation, and to a place where we don't need to try to articulate. We're content somehow given that momentary glimpse, right? We are content just to experience God. And it's a, it's a sparkle, it's a shimmer, and then it is gone. But in that moment, too deep for words, we have experience, we know it. The divine mystery of our God, our Holy One. So we, in our attempt to describe, uh, try to describe sacred worth, we talked about that last week, of, say, the glaciers or the people that live near them. And we find ourselves divided on what is of sacred worth because it is so hard in our culture to say everybody has sacred worth. All places have sacred worth. Dr. Farley, who wrote the book this series is based on, Beguiled by Beauty, she says racism is when we reduce people to categories rather than seeing them as sacred worth. And we've been learning about systemic racism in the last year. Systemic racism, of course, is just systems 
where it's okay not to see the sacred worth in individuals or groups of people. And we've been learning about that across Canada, across British Columbia, and even across Victoria, where people are acting out of that. The images coming out of the residential schools have res often reduced us to wordlessness, a kind of hollowed out wow. Not the ecstatic wow of the glaciers, but a tragic wow as you see the markers on those graves in that green grass. So we can lose our sense of beauty and sacred worth when we don't see the sacred worth of all people, or that the world is a chance for us to participate fully in sacred stewardship. And so we can turn to that sad and broken part of us that says it's only important if it matters to me. It's only important if it helps me, if I'm the benefactor, if their life is to serve me. In the Lectio today, in the psalm, in the middle of that praise and attribution, suddenly there was this little paragraph about idols. And it felt kind of jarring, even though David did read it beautifully. But idolatry happens in many ways. But one of the ways it happens, as identified in the psalm, is when we start valuing things for what they can give us, even God. When we see ourselves as the most important part of creation and that everything else is here to serve us, even the divine one. So idolatry can be our trap when the idol we worship is our comfort zone our freedom not to be challenged, not to have to change. So we go back to the words and the advice and the instincts of Dr. Farley, who's a second or third generation theologian, deeply immersed in the work. She invites us to ground ourselves differently, to uh, not to be derailed when we can't put our wow into words, and not to be derailed when we see and experience the things of others, not valuing the sacred worth of others, but to ground ourselves as seeing our world unconnected to being a benefit to us, save we get to experience its sacred nature together. Sacred in ourselves, in our relationship with other equally sacred beings, other people. We don't know, we don't speak their language or share their culture, equally sacred to the creator. She suggests we ground ourselves in that and that we might well find that healing. I remember hearing my dad talk about the weekend that his, grand, his father died. I never met my grandfather. He died in Edmonton. And on my father's travel to be there with his mom, he said he found himself looking at the areas he was going through and find unbidden, thinking that this is the glory of God, these beautiful sights somehow were a gift to him in ways that he wasn't seeking, and not in a glib way. You know, it's beautiful if you just look for the beauty, but somehow, somehow his spirit was touched, and the grief was lessened, not revealed, not removed, rather, and not... Um, reduced beyond its, its reality. His dad had just suddenly died. But in that gift from nature, the gift of sacred stewardship, helped him as he made that tragic trip. So we pray together as a congregation, coming into a new reality starting next Sunday, that the sacred nature of life around us and within us will be a resource as we have to continually change in the months ahead. I believe that as we stay grounded, we'll be able to live a life of courage and a life of hope and a life of trust. I'm sure you've gone to camp, or if you ever have heard anybody come home from a Christian camp, they have little things they do with their fingers, about praying with different fingers. And one has to do with the word worship. W-O-R-S-H-I-P. When our reality seems hard, invoke praise. When our reality seems hard, invoke praise. 
St. Paul did, said that in Philippians, yes. you know, to think on the things that are beautiful and true. And so when our lives are hard in the days ahead, we are invited to invoke praise, something of sacred beauty around you, something of sacred beauty within you. Amen.